So what is a creative production technique anyway? To me, a creative recording technique is some kind of method of recording an instrument that doesn't follow a standard or known method. If you've been involved in rock recordings or, or live sound reinforcement, you know that there are tried and true methods for capturing certain instruments. Off the top of my head, an iconic standard for recording a snare drum would be to use the venerable Shure SM57. This creates that very familiar sound that has arguably become the sound of snare drum in rock music. And just like that technique, there are many more that are more or less known to work as a solid and reliable way to capture performances. And there are many occasions where using the standard techniques is probably a good move. Like if you're just trying to document a jam session of your band, you really don't want anything but a clear and normal sounding recording to evaluate potential song ideas. But what if you want a recording to not sound so standard? What if you want a recording that has some unique qualities to it that could help separate it from the other songs on your album? Well, that's when you can allow your imagination to run wild and use creative recording methods to enhance a song. My name is Ken Andrews, and welcome to episode six, all about creative recording techniques. One of the songs I'm most proud of in the Failure catalog is a song from Fantastic Planet called Blank. I love the song, but I also love the production, which for us at the time was quite a departure and a fun few days of experimenting. This was a song that Greg presented during the making of Fantastic Planet, and initially I thought we should probably just capture it as a stripped-down ballad of a guitar and vocal only, as the song clearly stood up in that simple form. But then we kind of realized the slow tempo and overall openness of the song actually created a lot of space we could fill with stuff. But the last thing we wanted to do was a standard ballad treatment of, say, piano and string pads. Instead, we wanted to create some unique sounds to offset the softer ballad-like nature of the song itself and hopefully make something unique. So let's dive into the recording of Blank. Here's the session, and I've already kind of organized this session, so let me just walk you through that. I've labeled the tracks, and there's not that many tracks, as you can see. Three, four of those are stereo, so I guess around 24, 25 tracks. The low track count is, I think, one of the reasons why this song has this unique sound to it. This is a basic template I've talked about before. I have the audio tracks above my effects returns. Just for this mix right now, I just have five effects. Most of them are my uh, favorite kind of room simulation, the Oceanway Studios plugin. I've got one for drums, one for guitars, one for vocals. Below my effects returns, I have uh, my subgroups, uh, drums, percussion, bass, guitars, keyboards, sound effects, and vocals. And that covers this song. All of those subgroups are feeding the stereo bus down here. And here are some plugins that I have on my stereo bus. We have sort of like two sets of plugins that I use here. They're following a, a logic of what I used to do in the good old analog days. We have the console emulation mix bus by Waves. Uh, this is called their NLS, and they have three consoles here, an SSL modeled, a, a tube console, and a Neve. And I'm just got a little bit of drive, just a couple dB of drive into that. Just add a little bit of harmonic sweetness. Then I have an SSL bus compressor. Then I have a stereo in the form of a UAD Manly uh, Massive Passive. And then you would have a tape machine. In this case, I'm using another UAD, Universal Audio, Ampex, ATR-102 emulation, which is kind of an amazing um, plugin. Lots of different sounds you can get out of this plugin. So this chain here, the first column inserts A through E, is kind of like what you would do in an analog workflow. Then I've already instantiated the SSL G channel on each track. Let's just start with the guitars. <laughs> I guess I should say guitar, because 
This song is essentially one performance. Uh, it's Greg playing my uh, blonde Les Paul, my 76 Les Paul. This track of the performance is a Fender Twin Reverb. Pretty sure this is literally just the guitar going straight into the Fender Twin. The amps turned up a bit to get a little bit of overdrive, a little bit of hair on it, and sustain. And then we've got the spring reverb going as well. But we wanted something with a lot of depth, so routed the guitar to my Marshall. There's a, a phaser pedal that's only going to the Marshall and not to the, the Fender Twin. And that's what really creates the stereo effect when you have them both going at the same time. That was like the first kind of creative technique that we employed on this song. So let's go to the top and get into the drums. Now, the first track here is a loop that we created using the Eventide H3000 that we had. That was our main effects box for this record. And we used it a lot, especially the sampling function. And that's what this sound is right here. The ADAT tape that we used to create this loop. I wish I could pull that up for you, but alas, we weren't thinking that far ahead back in 95. Those work tapes to create this loop were erased and used for another song. So that is a little bit of a bummer. I wish I had that for you so I could really pull this apart and show you how this is created. But we can hear the loop at least in isolation here and you can get a feel for all the different elements that we had going. So we have a drum kit, kick and a snare and a hi-hat. Now obviously there's a lot of other things going on in there. What are they? Those are bongos. That's what starts it right there. What are some of the other elements? Well, it's a hammered dulcimer. Hammered dulcimer. There's a delay on the snare. The creak that you hear there was, I'm pretty sure, an actual creak in the floor of the control room. We played the creak into the loop. All right, um, next track, drum kit. Now, why is the drum kit only on two tracks. Let me just play you a little bit of drum kit. Now that is not the sort of normal drum kit sound that we recorded on most of the record. It's a more ambient recording of the drum kit. Now why would you want to do that? Well, in this case, it's because the loop itself that the drum kit plays along with has close mic kick and snare in it. If you have two drum kits, record one of them close mic with the more direct and punchy transients, and then record the other one very ambiently with less punchy transients. And then when you have the inevitable kick and snare drums that don't line up to kind of blur that issue makes it sound a bit more integrated. So let's hear those together. That was a creative decision, but also basically fueled by technical limitations. Kind of a proponent of that sort of situation where you have an idea, but how do you actually execute it with the tools you have? Well, you have to make some compromises and maybe some decisions you don't particularly want to make, but in the end, they might lead you to a place that is a little unexpected. Now we get to one of my favorite things to record during the album, which was an upright bass that we were borrowing from a friend of ours. Blank is the song where the upright is most featured. We took our time making sure we got a good capture of it. So there's two tracks of it. It did have a pickup in it, which we recorded as a DI. And here's what that sounds like. Knocking off pretty much all the high end. I just want to get rid of all the, the clacky stuff, which can be a little distracting. 
with the compression just trying to create a little bit more sustain. So that's the DI. Here's my mic by itself. I believe it was a AKG uh, 414, which is what we were using as overheads sometimes, and, or sometimes room mics. That was our most expensive condenser mic we had. And so anything acoustic, like acoustic guitars, we tended to use that mic. And then here they are together, the, the upright DI and the upright mic. Okay, so let's see how that's working with our drums. Adding in the loop here. I'll tell you what, it didn't hurt that Greg already had a few years of playing fretless bass. I have to give it up for him because his intonation is pretty good. Let's go down here and here with the whole rhythm section. Kit, loop, upright, and main guitar. All right, just to kind of glue everything together a little bit, at this point I'm going to turn on the um, some of the stereo bus stuff. That's the um, Neve Mix Bus uh, emulation. Here's a SSL bus compressor. In that house that we were renting, there was, under one of the beds in one of the bedrooms, a digital piano. Plugged it straight in to the Mackie just to hear what it did, and it had a bunch of digital piano presets. However, we had a lot of other cool gear there, including my guitar rig, which had quite a few pedals in it, distortion boxes, different amps. This is the distorted piano track in blank. You're hearing two different amps panned and tons of distortion. It sounds like there's amp distortion as well as like probably some pedal fuzz. It's like the note is there, but it's just surrounded in a chaotic ocean of distortion. There's just all these cool artifacts and harmonics and resonances that were not in the original piano sound. But once you run it through that many pedals, something good is bound to happen, right? I'm sure someone had distorted a piano before us, but we hadn't really heard it in the context of, of a band like ours yet. We use this sound anywhere else on the record. We pulled up a few of the songs, maybe just some rough mixes, and just played along with those to see if anything happened. And that's where we got the intro to Stuck On You. Now the other thing we were starting to get into, placing sound effects that weren't necessarily musical on their own, but if you placed them in the right spot, maybe the way they related to the other instruments and maybe the way they related to some of the lyrics, the first sound effect that you would hear in the song is some laughing. This is from a copyright-free CD that I bought. So I looped it in the Eventide and then played it in. Pops up down here. And then comes in strong for the end. They're actually printed at different levels because if I could predict where they needed to be in the mix so I didn't have to move that fader during the mix, I would do that. Then we have this whoosh sound, which is very stereo and happens a couple times. It just creates a little bit of 
interest as you're listening to the song. Let's look at the vocals. So it's basically one vocal track. Greg wanted me to sing in a very uh, breathy kind of kind of intimate voice, you know. What can we run the vocals through that could be unique for this song? One pedal in my guitar rig that didn't have any modulation or even distortion. It was a actually a guitar compressor pedal, the Blue Boss CS1. That pedal was a big part of my clean guitar sounds, and it became kind of a vocal sound for Blank and maybe a couple other spots on the record. So here it is. No conviction in your numb mind A hidden cell of chemicals Pedal compression on the lead vocal throughout the song. Now, as I've shown in previous videos, one of the things I like to do is chop the vocal up onto different tracks for the different parts of the song. Tiny bit of EQ, lopping off the very top, Cutting some 200. You don't really have to compress it more because it's very compressed. Wave C4 multiband compressor. No conviction in your mind. It's not working too hard. It's just picking up some S's really at the top. And then last but not least, I have this all the time at the end of vocal chains to give me some more apparent level, but also to thicken the sound. What it does is, you know, it takes off a lot of the fizz, thickens up the, the mid-range and the, and the lower mid-range. No conviction in your numb mind And she knows I kind of like the blank way You fill up my mind What's great about working this way is that at any point you can be like, my vocals are too low in this section. Without engaging automation, I can just come over and just mm, clutch that up, three tenths of a dB, not having to worry about anywhere else in the song. Now, you'll notice that in the body of main part of the song here, I actually don't have any effects on the vocals. As we get deeper into the song, We've got a lot more of the live drum kit coming in, and so the vocal needs to become not only louder, but maybe a little bit wider. You know, in listening to the original album mix of the song, I engaged a micro pitch shift effect on the lead vocal, and maybe a slap delay as well. Soloed. And I care for nothing. I'll turn off the slap just so you can really hear it. That I like the blank way. And then with the micro pitch shift. That I like the blank way. Use micro pitch shift a lot on Fantastic Planet. I'm creating it here with the Sound Toys micro shift plugin. So we got micro pitch shift and some slap on the lead vocal, and then we have an actual harmony track, which is for a couple lines here in this section, this blank way section. <laughs> not sure how I did it in the mix in 95, but I wanted that vocal to seem further away and way more ambient. I'm creating that effect here now with the Ocean Way uh, Room plugin. I've selected the vocal group source, doing a high pass filter on two of the mics, dropping a lot of low out of it in their EQ that's on the output. Here's what that sounds like without it. And with it. I fell up the sky. All right, moving down. Let's listen to the the ba ba backing vocals. Ba, 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 da, da, ba, 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 da, da, I'm using that same room. Tiny bit of compression and a lot of low cut. There's four tracks of it, and I have them hard panned. Okay, 
how we're going to end this thing, I think what we should do is slowly fade the elements out as the song is ending, leaving just the live drum kit and a dry vocal. Muted the double on the vocal there. I think we wanted it to feel like you were going back into the interior of your of your own mind. So we take the ambience off the vocals, dry it right up, and it just feels like you're kind of talking to yourself in the closet. Okay, so. That's going to wrap it up for this episode about creative recording techniques. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like the video. And if you'd like to see more and be notified, don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Later.